Uh, hello, everyone. So like Luke just said, let's shift gears a little bit. I'm going to be talking today about the mid-Pleistocene transition. But before I go on, I would like to uh, thank my co-workers, particularly Steve Goldstein, which has taken part in this research uh, intensively, but also the people like Alison Hartman, Rachel Lupin, Louis Bolch, and Injo Bu, all from, from Le Mans. So the mid-Pleistocene transition is mostly marked by a fundamental change in the glacial interglacial periodicity, which shifts from 41,000 years to 100,000 year cycles. And it's also accompanied by uh, increased glacial interglacial variability. This is clearly seen on a wavelet spectral analysis on this benthic isotope uh, stack over the last two million years, where you can clearly identify this 41 kilo year um, um, frequency down here below, you know, before one million years, and then sometime around this uh, interval, the 100 kilo years periodicity shows up. So there's been many hypotheses to explain why this happened, and it would be completely impossible for me to go in detail into all these hypotheses in, in this talk. But in general, all these um, potential explanations fall into three different categories. Uh, namely, nonlinear responses to orbital forcing, in second place, internal changes in the ocean atmosphere ice volume dynamics, such as, for instance, long-term coolings of SSTs in the Atlantic and the Pacific, but also long-term secular changes of uh, atmospheric CO2, like uh, those shown in this work by Barbel Honish in 2009. On the third group of hypotheses, we may have changes in glacial dynamics. Uh, in particular, important in this category are the increased stability and thickness of the Laurentide ice sheets, the so-called regolith hypothesis, but also more recently work by Harry Elderfield and others also highlighted the importance of the Antarctic ice sheet and how the stability of this big um, ice mass might have impacted the, uh, uh, the, the MPT uh, during this um, time. But what about the ocean? You know, what about the thermohaline circulation? Uh, we know that nowadays this uh, mechanism is generally accepted as a key climate modulator. You know, it basically redistributes heat and salt around the globe. And um, also, based on some proxy data that we have uh, in the literature, there are strong evidences that indicate that the deep ocean can also be an active storage for CO2 during glacial uh, periods. Therefore, it could be an important feedback mechanism on glacial interglacial time scales. Um, so, do we have evidences for changes in the thermohaline circulation during the MPT? And the answer is yes, we do. Um, they are mostly all based on benthic carbon isotopes. In particular, I'm going to be showing here some data from the uh, Cape Basin, um, this set of uh, ODP cores, 1088, 1090, and 1089. And the benthic carbon isotopes on these three cores essentially show an increased carbon-13 gradient between what they call a uh, shallow, well-ventilated uh, water versus a deeper, poorly ventilated water before and after the MPT. Essentially, the gradient between these two water masses increases as we go from pre-MPT periods of time into post-MPT uh, time periods. But, however, these benthic carbon records in the deep South Atlantic are limited by one uh, observation, and that's the fact that the glacial carbon-13 values fall below the Pacific end member. If you look here, site 849 in the Pacific, it's right in the middle. So site 1090, which is the deeper one of these two, have all through this all through the last million years, more negative values than the Pacific end member. Therefore, it's extremely complicated to interpret this just simply in terms of strength of ocean thermohaline circulation. So what can we do about that? Well, we can use an, uh, another set of tools, like for instance, neodymium isotopes, which are quasi-conservative tracers, both in the modern ocean, also using paleo records as proxies for thermohaline circulation strength. And I'm not going to go in greater detail how neodymium isotopes work, but just to give you a brief overview, if we take all the modern ocean seawater epsilon neodymium values below 2,000 meters and we plot the distribution by basin, we see that the North Atlantic is characterized by fairly negative epsilon neodymium values. And as we move south, the equatorial Atlantic, the South Atlantic, and the Southern Ocean, the values become progressively more positive until we go into the, the South Pacific. Just to give you a much clearer view of how this 
actually works in the ocean. I'm showing this um, uh, geotraces section along the South Pacific. Um, this is a, an amazing work done by Inja Gu, and she'll be presenting a poster uh, later this week on Thursday afternoon, so I really encourage you to stop by and check it out. But what we see here is epsilon dimming at the top, salinity at the bottom, and we have this uh, negative tongue of NADW moving south here, values around minus 12 or so, Antarctic intermediate water and Antarctic bottom water moving north with more radiogenic values. So going back to these um, K basin sites, we just decided to concentrate on site 1088 on top of the modern NADW core in the southwest, uh, sorry, in the southeast Atlantic, and the deeper site 1090 down here. And the modern ocean epsilon edimium values in this region range from minus 10, minus 10.5 for the NADW, and minus 8 to minus 8.5 uh, in the southern ocean waters in the circumpolar deep water. So essentially, um, when if we were to look into the pillar records in these two sites, we would interpret more negative epsilon edimium values to indicate more North Atlantic source waters getting into the South Atlantic, whereas more positive values will indicate the opposite, more presence of Southern Ocean waters here. And for those of you interested in more details on this work, I'd encourage you to check on this paper that we published earlier this year. So let's get into the data. Here, uh, time scale, 1.5 million years roughly, benthic oxygen isotopes for site 1088 and site 1090, remember intermediate depth, 2,000 meters, and deeper site, 3,700 meters. So um, what we decided to do here was let's just concentrate on the peak glacial and peak interglacial intervals at these two sites from the time interval between 600,000 and 1.1 uh, 1, uh, thousand kilo years. So these are the results. In red, you see epsilon edimium values on this axis here for the interglacials down here, and the blue dots correspond to the glacial periods. So what's interesting when you first look at this data is that, let's just look first at interglacial data. All the interglacial data seem to fall on the same range between minus 10, minus 9.5 here, with the only exception of this data point that corresponds to MIS 23 here. But when we look at the, uh, at the glacial data, the values, you know, before what we would, what we would call the pre-MPT time period, the glacial values are also relatively quite negative. You know, they also indicate presence of North Atlantic source waters during this time interval. But there is a drastic reduction in the epsilon edimium value here after MIS 24, and then the glacial values stay at the same uh, relatively positive level between minus 7.5 and, and minus 8. And this pattern it's also shown in the deeper core with a slightly more progressive uh, change compared to the shallower side. So um, what happens at interglacial, uh, at the uh, marine isotope stage 23 around 900,000 kilo years? Well, it, this is what Steve Goldstein likes to call a transglacial. Essentially, it's an interglacial that never happened. And it's marked by the total absence of North Atlantic, sea, North Atlantic source water at both sides. When you look at the absolute epsilon edimium values here at site 1088 and site 1090, the values correspond to glacial values or even more positive here, and almost the same is going on here. So we could say that based on the, at least just based on the epsilon edimium results, the deep ocean circulation in the South Atlantic shifted from a pre-MPT, very active uh, glacial thermohaline circulation to a post-MPT uh, reduce thermohaline circulation during glacial periods, whereas interglacials stay constant through time with the only exception of this time, uh, of this event at MIS 23. So for those of you that like to visualize it in a more cartoony way, um, again, the time period between uh, 1.1 to 950 kilo years, uh, we have interglacial here in red, epsilon edimium values. So presence of North Atlantic source waters at both sides, both during interglacial periods, but also during glacial periods. 
On the other side, in the post-MPT uh, time interval between 860 and 600 kilo years, interglacials essentially stay the same, but are, the glacial periods are the ones that show the striking difference, and that's a much more reduced presence of North Atlantic source waters. But can we quantify that? You know, this is just based on absolute Nadimian values. Is there a way for us to show how much of a change that actually uh, corresponds to in the, in the uh, thermohaline circulation? Um, the answer is yes, we can do that. We can use a binary mixing model, assuming constant um, end member values in the North Atlantic and in, in the North Pacific, and we can possibly estimate the percentage of North Atlantic source waters that get into the South Atlantic. And to give you a reference, this is the modern Cape Basin uh, mixing proportions, around 75%. At the modern Southern Ocean, we have around 60% here. And this would be the values that you would expect during Heinrich Stadial 1. So just to put it into context, when we look again at the MIS-23 here, and we compare the relative proportion of, F of North Atlantic source water that reaches this site at that time, it's comparable to the values that you would expect in the South Atlantic during Heinrich Stadial 1 based on previously published epsilon Edemian data in the vicinity. And this is just, you know, amazing that you can have such a reduction in the presence of North Atlantic source waters during this time interval that would correspond to a scenario that we'd like to picture in something like that. And what is even more striking is that when it's actually during this time interval here that proxy uh, records of atmospheric CO2 and model reconstruction show the largest shift on, on the largest drop in the atmospheric PO2 across that interval. So, I mean, to me, that's definitely not a, a constant. This is some be, there must be some process going on here that really helps to, that really um, links together this reduction in thermal circulation and the uh, drop of atmospheric PCO2. And we could even argue that this THC slowdown or collapse between MIS 24 to 22 might have facilitated the, um, the atmospheric CO2 drawdown by reducing the exchange between the Antarctic surface and, and, the, um, and the deep waters. So in summary, we conclude that the mid Pleistocene transition was marked by a drastic change in the deep ocean thermohaline circulation during glacials. Uh, the ocean circulation in the South Atlantic shifted from an active pre-MPT glacial mode into a reduced post-MPT glacial uh, THC mode. Uh, in contrast, the vigor of the THC pre and post-MPT has remained similar during interglacials, with the only exception of the transglacial MIS-23 at around 900 kilo years. Um, the weak glacial thermohaline circulation may have facilitated the atmospheric CO2 dry down by reducing exchange between surface and deep waters. And these effects all together might have contributed to a minor uh, ice sheet expansion through this time interval that might just um, generate the conditions to cross the threshold to further the 100 kilo years glacial interglacial cycles. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leo. We have time for questions. Echo has a question. So for the recent, uh, recent glacial cycles, we know that the Danska Rusher event or somehow, somehow the AMOC has changed stadial, interstadial. And, and when you look at your data, are you looking at the kind of real mean state or kind of freak, um, change of frequency in those uh, um, millennial oscillation? Well, for now, we just have a very coarse resolution. We just have data, the peak glacials or peak interglacials at this time period. But it's, this is actually a work in progress, and the, uh, we hope to have high resolution records, com almost comparable to oxygen isotope records in the near future. And you know, when that happens, I might be able to, to answer that question. Any more questions? I, I was tempted to ask a question. I think we have time. Uh, you listed some, some different options for how the mid Pleistocene tr transition might have been um, brought about, regular hypothesis, that kind of thing. And I was wondering if you could be tempted to kind of comment on how this might connect with those propositions. And you've highlighted the contribution um, 
of the of your changes to an ice sheet expansion, but could it be the other way around? Does it place any constraints on those hypotheses? Right. I mean, I think everything is linked. It's just it's like the chicken and the egg. You know, it's really hard when this um, resolution in these records to try to establish lead and lags between uh, processes or what what is causing what. But there is definitely a link between atmospheric CO2 and deep ocean circulation, and that might have might have a, you know, also a feedback effect on 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 the global temperatures. Therefore, promoting bigger and thicker ice sheets and so on. So everything is connected, but you know, we're still not at the point that we can establish this uh, lead-like relationship. Okay. Thanks for